Good morning, Jasmine, Janet, good morning. morning. Hope everybody's doing well. I'm gonna go back on mute.
Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for session five, entitled Full Writers in Action. My name is Alicia Montague, and I will be your moderator for this session. Please feel free to type in the chat your location, where you did your Fulbright grant, or what brought you to the session today. Make sure to set your chat to everyone so that all participants can see your message. In this session, we have Dr. Yasmin Cohen and Dr. Abdullah Al Gabani presenting on Fulbright Alumni Global Friendships in Action, Teacher Training in Yemen. Next, we will have Janet Goldner, who will be presenting an ongoing dialogue about art, life, and building bridges. Followed by Kevin F. Quigley and Dr. Bruce Severe, who will be speaking about Fulbright Chronicles, an online peer-reviewed journal on Fulbright's impact. And to wrap up the presentations, we have Parul Srivastava presenting on studying the people in India's partition. All of our speakers will present on their topic. Then we'll leave about 20 to 25 minutes for Q&A. Throughout the presentations, please use the Q&A feature to ask questions and state the name of the presenter or presenters to whom you are asking the question. I will try to get to as many questions as time will allow. Now I will hand it over to Dr. Cohen to kick off the presentations. Dr. Cohen? Um, do we have a power to share the screen? Yes, you do, you do. Do you see the share screen? Ah, uh, yes, now okay, I- Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So while we do this, okay. So welcome everybody um, to Dr. Abdullah and I. So my name is Dr. Yasmin Bay Cowan and I'm at Toro College, New York. Um, and here is Dr. Abdullah. Abdullah. Uh, hello everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Abdullah Ghurbani. Uh, I work as an assistant professor at Sana'a University and uh, I'm talking to you from Sana'a, Yemen. So how did we first meet? Uh, it was actually back in 2012 when I got a grant from the Fulbright to do my TESOL uh, certification at uh, Renert uh, International uh, in New York. Uh, it was a very uh, fruitful course, uh, TESOL certification. Uh, run by uh, School of International Training. And it was there when uh, I met uh, Dr. Jasmine Quinn. Uh, we, we had really a great time uh, for, for a whole month. Uh, the, the training was really amazing. We learned a lot of techniques, strategies uh, related to teaching English to speakers of other languages. And we went together through a hurricane. And oh, that was true. That was quite yeah. the thing. So then, um, there was a pause while um, um, Professor uh, while Abdullah went on to do his career in Sana'a. I became an assistant professor and teaser practicum coordinator for teaser um, and bilingual department at Toro College. And then one day we reconnected um, actually through LinkedIn. And I found Abdullah and I was like, oh my God. And we found and we immediately reconnected Abdullah. This is true. And, and that was uh, like a year ago. And we started talking about uh, what we're doing. And we discovered that both of us are Fulbright, Fulbrighters and we are working on the same field, which is TESOL. Uh, so Dr. Jasmine uh, Kuen was really generous. And when she heard about the program that I'm doing here in Sana'a, she gave a grant to, to train uh, TESOL teachers here in Yemen. Uh, it was when I told her that I got a Fulbright grant uh, back in 2019, and we trained uh, 30 Yemeni teachers uh, in Yemen. So at the time that I was speaking with um, Abdullah, I was also part of a working group um, for the Sherpa Institute, and we were looking as, uh, at SDG4 education. And my specialty was by 4C, that by 2030 substantially increased the supply of qualified teachers 
including through international cooperation for teacher training in developing countries, especially least developed countries. And then I found out that Abdullah actually does this teacher training. And it came to me that life has been good. Fulbright gave me a tremendous opportunity to come to America to study. And here was a way to give back to the community and work towards the sustainable development goals. Abdullah? Yes, this is true. We, we found uh, through our uh, communication that we have a common goal and vision, which is to train qualified Yemenis with a passion for teaching English, uh, addressing the Yemeni teacher shortage of professional English teachers and addressing the pressing need in Yemeni society of learning English across all age levels, uh, modeling the Fulbright idea of lifelong learning and shaping a more positive vision for our communities and our world. We, we discovered also that we have some research uh, I mean, common interests. So we started working from there. Yes, and, and one of the things that really, you know, is the power of education is that when you are a Fulbrighter and you immerse yourself in other cultures, the ability to communicate across cultures becomes a gift, a lifelong gift. And this is something that we received um, through Fulbright and that's why we can work well so well together. So we are excited to work uh, from the Fulbright 75 a blueprint to build communities and address challenges and strengthen this personal growth. And Abdullah, can you tell us a little bit more about Yemen and our cohorts? Because it's really special. Oh, this is uh, my pleasure. Yeah, as you all know, Yemen uh, is located uh, south of Saudi Arabia. It's, it's a huge country. But unfortunately, we have been under war for, for almost seven years. And, and this is one of the difficulties that uh, Yemeni English language teachers face. So we're excited to work uh, to, together. Uh, as I said, back in 2018 and 19, I, I got a, a Fulbright grant and we trained 30 Yemeni teachers. And, and this year I got a grant from uh, Dr. Jasmine Quinn and we trained two cohorts. The, whole, the, the two cohorts, like 20 teachers are limited to 10 trainees with equal gender distribution, which means we take five male and five female teachers. The training is open to all, uh, regardless of age. And Future Horizons Foundation for Translation and Training and Development uh, graduates serve as role models, helping diverse students' populations throughout Yemen. Uh, I'm glad to, to, to also add that this year, uh, like last month, I, I got another Fulbright grant to train uh, 50 Yemeni teachers and this will help really improve the quality of teaching English in Yemen. And again, I would like to, to thank Amidis Fulbright and also Dr. Jasmine for, for helping and supporting in improving the quality of teaching in Yemen. So when we look at, um, at these workshops, I also, you know, due to the power of Zoom, uh, function as a specialty expert in terms of technology. So I support the training by being an expert trainer in, in matters of open access education and, um, um, and, and also technology. So our hope is that by training all of these English teachers, when you take a look, Yemen has a very large coastline that eventually we will see tourism and we will have students who are prepared to work in the hospitality industry. So let's keep going. And um, let's talk uh, for a moment um, about our research. So one, um, one part of our research is simulation training and there's a program called sim school because it's something that I do as a practicum coordinator I train teachers. So simulation training in a virtual environment for TESOL teachers in Yemen. We are in development. Um, we have a grant from Sim School, which runs these simulations. And we are working on providing uh, culturally appropriate avatars representing Yemeni students. So we can take these cohorts that we taught so far and also put them in a virtual training ground. The next um, the next research um, agenda that we have done is we have done pre and post training disposition surveys of all of our trainees so far. And our last one is very, very exciting. Abdullah, you are um, right now in the thick of it, right? And that is about, 
Yes, tell us about it. This is true. Uh, two weeks ago, I started the, the program, which is the Fulbright program training uh, 50 Yemeni teachers. And we started uh, asking uh, the trainees about their reflection. How do they feel of the training uh, pre and post? How does this program change their uh, teaching techniques? And it has been really uh, going well. And Dr. Jasmine and I will do some analysis for, for the reflections. And hopefully in, in the coming conference, we'll present this. Yes. And so um, again, to, 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 to um, come back to the Fulbright idea, it is really through Fulbright that both of us learned how to communicate across cultures and to feel comfortable in a collaborative environment. And because of Fulbright, we felt comfortable reaching out to each other and have fruitful professional discussions. This is, you know, he was not a strange, I knew he was a Fulbrighter, right? So immediately I That's felt true. sort of a kinship. How did you feel, Abdullah? Oh, it was really great to, to, to get connected uh, again together and work together in, in training and research. That, that's really a great opportunity. So when we, when we look, this is what you see here now is one of our graduate cohorts uh, with Abdullah being... Um, this is one of... Yes, that's right. This is one, one of the cohorts that they graduated last month and uh, under the... Yes, and it shows also what the power, you know, when you think about, you know, where am I in my life? I, don't, I am not, you know, a tremendously wealthy person, but here, an investment in one teacher, when you think about it, SDG 4C, professional teaching, an investment in the professionalization of one teacher reaps benefits for 20 to 30 years for hundreds and hundreds of students. And that is the power of, um, of our Fulbright legacy to have the ability to find others who are interested in making the world a better place. Abdullah, would you like to take this to a close? This is true. Uh, this is what the graduates say. Actually, they feel that the TISO program uh, not only changes their, their teaching uh, career, but also it changes their, their, their lives because now uh, they, they can uh, perform better and uh, they will uh, contribute in improving the quality of teaching in Yemen. So this comes, we come to an end. I see the 10 minutes are over, but we wanted to invite all of you who have so graciously joined and, and spent your time listening to us. If you are interested in collaborating with us or doing a research project with us, please feel free to drop us a note. Abdullah and I, we are open um, to, to research opportunities and, and we will... other projects, right? Yeah, we will be really glad to work together with other writers yes so thank you very much and i am going thank to, you very much and i'm going to hand this over to our gracious host thank you and i'm going to post my email abdullah maybe you should post your email in there so that people sure. know how to get into contact with us okay thank, thank you very much uh, for the fulbright for giving us this opportunity to participate in this wonderful conference thanks so much yasmin and Abdullah. Um, next up, we do have Janet Golder. Please feel free to come on screen and share your um, screen as well if you have a presentation. Um, hello, my name is Janet Goldner. I'm an artist, activist, and researcher. Um, you'll see some of my work, you can see some of my works in the virtual art exhibition that is part of this conference. Um, the title of my presentation is Iniche, Thank You, Merci, an ongoing collaboration about life, art, and building bridges. I was born to a family of political activists and grew up in the DC suburbs, immer immersed in the social issues of the 1960s. I studied and traveled in West Africa for a year when I was in college, and the heart of my journey was Mali. Um, the images shown show the, so the Dogon dancers in Sangha Mali. The two on the right are my fellow passengers and a truck that broke down in Northern Mali, and a young girl who pre 
befriended me in southern Niger during that first trip. During my Fulbright Senior Research Fellowship in 1994-95, I worked with Mali, in Mali with potters, metalsmiths, and contemporary artists. Since then, I have spent several months in Mali every year in a continuing dialogue with Malian artists about our lives, our work, our creative process. We work together as friends and as artist colleagues. Members of the group Bogolan Kasabani and I met during my Fulbright. Um, Kasabani is my Malian family and most of my projects in Mali have involved members of the group. Through shared experiences and intent, we have been involved in a multifaceted artistic collaboration for the last 25 years. The image shows the six artists of the group Bogolan Kasabani, Kanjura Kulabali, Kritigi Dembele, Suleiman Goro, Baba Keita, Bubakar Dumbia, and Nene Chow. Um, this is one of their works that you're looking at now on the screen. Um, the group Kasabani has been working together since the night, late 1970s. They are largely responsible for having elevated Bogolan, a traditional textile technique used to decorate garments to an important symbol of national and even Pan-African identity. Although usually translated as mud cloth, Bogolan actually refers to a clay slip with a high iron content that produces a black color when applied to cotton cloth. The group moved Bogolan from craftsmanship to art. Their insistence on using local materials and elevating materials associated with craft is a strategy employed by contemporary artists throughout the world. Their objective was to rescue and promote Bogolan and have it valued as artistic expression. Some factors that make our collaboration work include Kasabani's skill at collaboration through their years of work as a group and the Mali val Malian value of collectivity, one of the aspects of Malian culture that Kasabani has fought to, has fought to explore and preserve. And the members of Kasabane and I are all about the same age. My experience with collaboration stems from the American feminist art movement of the 70s and 80s, where collaboration growing out of consciousness raising was a way to break down isolation in American culture. We work collaboratively to engage communities and address social issues. The movement pioneered new approaches to group identity through collaborative performance, women's co-op galleries, leaderless institutions, and inclusive artworks. My, our, my, our collaboration, uh, Kasubani and I, is at, it, as, at its core a friendship that helps, us, helps sustain us as artists. These relationships have also resulted, resulted in and influenced concrete projects and works of art both individual and collective through respect, connection, community, responsibility, and privileges. An important aspect of such friendships across culture, race, history is a balancing act between seeing no differences between us and never for, us, for an instant forgetting the differences. As, as Conjurer as said to me, we are all at the same time researcher and objects of research. I, I study you and you also study me. You open your life to me and I need to be honest and open my life to you as well. The following is a long quote from Dembele. When artists meet each other in order to work together, it comes from our ideas. With Kasabani, we found that you had ideas and we had ideas and our ideas converged towards the same point. We had the same way of understanding the problems of the world. We had just about the same thinking. The Kasabani are defenders of traditional culture. And when you arrived here, we saw that you also defended traditional culture. Your residence in Mali was in Segu and our point of departure was also Segu, thus we had about the same way of seeing things. And your, way of, and, and your way of working also. You work in steel and we work with clay. And we said to ourselves that this is the work of the same person because traditionally it is blacksmiths who are the first artists. 
we who are men and should work in steel, and she is the one who works in steel, and women, women who should work in clay, and we are the ones who work with clay. This is something that also attracted our attention. And she, and she also was thirsty to understand the culture and little by little we taught her how to live here in Mali because it is rare that she has not traveled with us. And that has permitted her to understand a lot about the cultures of Mali and also collaborated our, facilitated our collaboration. We have also traveled to her country, the US, and we have made several trips and we have seen really how she lives there also their way of life and their way of understanding this world. Each of us has seen, each of us, she has seen how we work. We have seen her studio as well and her house. She has seen where we were born and where we grew up. Kandra said to me, you see the US, you see Mali, you see artists that manage to find each other and pull each other like a cable. The way we collaborate is to come from here and see our is to come here and see our culture and to be in this culture and to give a force to expressing your thoughts from another culture and taking the best of this culture and to say yes and agreeing the other can receive this culture like a way of pulling African collaboration towards an American collaboration. Our collab our way of collaborating brings a new way of working. To always work in the same system can become monotonous and repetitive. Artistic and social collaboration and evolution of the society and collaboration gives a lot of harmony. Because it is my purpose to, to participate in lived Malian culture, I have become part of families. When I am in Bamako, I live where close to where my collaborators live. I have been to the remote villages where my friends were born, though they have lived in Bamako for a long time. I have met their mothers, brothers, cousins. I have watched children grow up and family dramas unfold over the years. And I have played a part in these events. This image uh, is Dante Guimari, another one of Casabani's works. My aim has always been to break down barriers. My interest in Mali was first in the philosophy of the culture itself, as much as artistic techniques and forms. It is the richness of the diversity of cultural adaptations that continues to fascinate me. In, in 2012, a crisis erupted in Mali that continues to this day. In 2014, Kandra Dembele, Sira Sosoko and I directed Karal, an artist residency on the theme of peace, reconciliation and social cohesion funded by USAID. Politicians have talked a lot about the crisis in Mali. The government, religious and community leaders and international and regional organizations have played a role in looking for solutions Ordinary Malians have not had much opportunity to comment on the crisis, even though they are the most affected. Through this artistic legacy residency, visual artists brought their contribution to this call for peace and social cohesion in Mali. The message was communicated by artworks created over a period of three weeks in Mopti on the edge of the northern regions of the country between the parts that had been occupied by jihadists for nine months in 2012 and the parts that remained in Malian government control. The idea of the residency close to the regions that had been occupied heightened the theme of peace, reconciliation and social cohesion to immortalize the events by leaving traces and strong images through artists analysis and perceptions. Contemporary and traditional sensitivities contributed to the search for solutions. Participants represented all the regions of Mali, many ethnic groups and a wide range of ages. The group also included men and women, refugees and internally displaced people. They worked on a wide variety of media, painting, sculpture, clay, metal and wood. Through their analysis of the crisis, they speak to the people of Mali and Africa and the world. The residency provided time, space, materials, and living conditions so that the artists can concentrate on their work without distraction. 
with where scarcity is the rule, we created abundance. We, what started as a group of four directors and 25 participants quickly became a team of 25 professional artists, all working intensely to express our experience, analysis, and solutions to the ongoing crisis in Mali. This resulted in the formation of a new artistic family with common vision of the role that cultural production can play in the life of a nation. The joy, harmony, and respect amongst the group is evident in the works of art that were produced. The end of one thought creates another, and as international military intervention stopped armed groups 12 miles from Mopti, we told ourselves that we must push our cohesion to the capital and the rest of the world. After the residency, the works were exhibited in Mopti and Bamako, we were honored with the presence of the American ambassador, the mayor of Bamako and government representatives at the opening of the exhibition in Bamako. The success of the project is the result of a long collaboration and friendship between Kasabani and me. That is the result of, of, of Fulbright. Thank you. I Thank you so much, Janet. Now we will hear from Kevin um, with co-presenters Bruce. Great, uh, good, good morning, uh, good, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. It's really a, a privilege to uh, be with uh, all of you and to be part of this conversation. And as uh, Jasmine and Abdullah did at the uh, start of this panel, we want to, Bruce and I want to have a conversation about the Fulbright Chronicles, which, which I, I think will speak to all of us because it's really de designed uh, to tell the story through an online peer reviewed uh, journal about the impact of, of Peace Corps. So our two goals are to have that conversation and, and two, to, to uh, encourage you and, uh, and uh, to participate in the Fulbright uh, Chronicles uh, in the months and years ahead. So Bruce, over to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Kevin. And uh, uh, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to talk uh, about a, uh, a new journal, uh, one that we have uh, high hopes for uh, in terms of it uh, uh, representing the incredible work of uh, Fulbrighters um, around the world. Uh, certainly not just US Fulbrighters, but Fulbrighters um, that are uh, visiting Fulbrighters, visiting scholars. Um, you know, Kevin, uh, I think is very uh, modest um, individual, but I wanted to talk just a little bit about him first. and tell you about uh, uh, some of his credentials, which I think are, are very impressive. Uh, Kevin comes from a background of uh, uh, involvement uh, in the Peace Corps in terms of being a volunteer, but also uh, a country director in Thailand, um, uh, and also served as the uh, executive director of, of the Fulbright Alumni Association. But that in addition to um, an, an array of uh, accomplishments in, in public service. Uh, he has um, really uh, distinguished himself in, in many different ways. And we go back um, uh, a little ways, uh, both of us being involved uh, uh, as Fulbrighters uh, in Thailand. Um, that's where we first met. And uh, I think that uh, that um, I look back on that now as being a very important event, um, which uh, has uh, allowed us really to collaborate on a number of different projects, um, uh, writing uh, scholarly projects, and um, uh, most importantly, uh, the Fulbright Chronicles. Um, so uh, if I could, um, uh, there's a few questions I, I think that we would like to you know, have a, a conversation about um, with that as background. Um, certainly, um, you know, why, why Fulbright Chronicles? Uh, why do we think that this is an important venture? Uh, you know, what do we uh, aim to, to try to accomplish uh, uh, with this? Um, 
I was I was uh, struck, Kevin, uh, by the prior presentations and, and what wonderful work it is. And I don't think that I would have known about this work uh, unless I had uh, been a part of this uh, particular uh, session, this, this conference. Uh, wouldn't it be nice um, if those uh, individuals um, had uh, submitted an article uh, to uh, this uh, forthcoming journal, uh, either as a, uh, a talking about their, uh, uh, their missions, uh, their important work, their scholarship, um, uh, but also maybe in the form of a commentary um, or in the form of a letter to the editor. Um, I think that one of the important things that, that I would like to get across about, uh, about this uh, uh, journal uh, is that we really want it to be the premier outlet uh, for the work of Fulbrighters, the impressive work uh, of Fulbrighters. And um, uh, just another you know, example um, of, of this very impressive work, I think every one of us is familiar with the most recent Nobel laureate um, uh, uh, having won the, the Nobel Peace Prize this year, Maria Ressa, uh, who was trying to safeguard freedom uh, of uh, expression uh, in her uh, country uh, of the Philippines uh, and has won this very uh, distinguished uh, award. And she was a former Fulbrighter. Uh, and uh, the Fulbright program was instrumental um, in her success. And it would be wonderful to have uh, her uh, uh, submit an article, um, uh, be invited to submit an article for uh, Fulbright Chronicles. Um, so uh, with that, Kevin, I think I'll yeah. hand it back to you. Maybe you can right. talk yeah. a little bit more about yeah. some of these right. issues. And, and, and again, thank you, Bruce, for, for talking about how what we hope to do with the Fulbright uh, Chronicles really relates to the uh, very rich, uh, engaging presentations during this uh, conference. And I, I uh, think uh, back to our first meeting in 2006. Uh, to, you were a Fulbrighter in 2006. We met in 2007. And, and uh, lots of years since, uh, when I was living in Bangkok later. Uh, and one of the things that struck me about uh, Bruce, in many ways, it was very similar uh, to what Janet described, that the Fulbright experience was uh, uh, life-altering. Uh, for you, that it uh, uh, engendered a lifelong connection uh, to Southeast Asia, starting in Thailand. And the work you did, much like Janet, ha has built a community of people uh, uh, interested in uh, psychology uh, that is, is now spreading throughout the, uh, the region. And, and that kind of uh, immersive and collaborative and horizontal, uh, horizon shifting a uh, career uh, uh, trajectory bending experience is, is uh, we hear uh, from Fulbrighters all the time. And I do have to chuckle a little, Bruce, you mentioned I was the head of the Fulbright Association. I think John Bader may not uh, agree. I, I'd been the head of the National Peace Corps Association, uh, which is the uh, a sponsor of this conference and a partner organization. And I think both the Fulbright and the Peace Corps share those uh, qualities of uh, really having a uh, life-changing impact on uh, those of us who've been privileged to be participants. So the goal of, of this is, is really to, to, uh, to uh, capture those stories and uh, um, to, uh, through uh, sc uh, scholarly articles, uh, uh, opinion pieces, uh, to find a way to, to uh, capture and narrate the, the dramatic impact of of the Peace Corps across so many countries and uh, through these uh, 75 years and hopefully many more uh, to come. So, so uh, Bruce, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm uh, curious about uh, what else do you hope to accomplish with this uh, Fulbright uh, Chronicles? Well, I think uh, uh, certainly, Kevin, uh, we want to be able to get out the, these really important stories um, and, and the important scholarship. Uh, and I think that that is, that is our, our number one uh, goal. 
Uh, but uh, in addition to that, I think that um, it, it will help in terms of certainly uh, promoting um, the good work um, of so many different Fulbrighters and so many different venues and so many different disciplines. Um, but I think that will also um, uh, foster future collaborations uh, in the same way in which uh, this conference, um, I think, helps to do that. I think that the uh, Fulbright Chronicles is, is, could potentially play a very important role uh, going forward in, in uh, accomplishing uh, the same purpose. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the important points that I, I try to make uh, when I've talked with others uh, about Fulbright Chronicles is that it's, it's really not a newsletter. Um, there are other uh, venues, newsletter type um, uh, publications that I think are important, but uh, you know, we, we really look at this as being a, a professional journal, uh, peer-reviewed journal, uh, open access journal, and we want to use the, the highest editorial standards that, that we possibly can. Um, and uh, I, was, I was heartened, Kevin, by uh, when we put the call out for uh, associate editors, um, that there were so many uh, Fulbrighters, uh, former Fulbrighters, who wanted to play a part in this. Uh, Kevin and I have had the difficult task now of sifting through a lot of the uh, applications to become uh, associate editors, and it's really a very uh, impressive uh, group and a very diverse group. And um, that, again, is something that we want to capture in the, in the articles uh, and commentaries and letters to the editor uh that will appear um so kevin i'll throw it back okay. to you yeah so just as, as we uh, wrap up uh, i wanted to thank everybody for for uh, uh your interest in this and and to invite your participation to suggest topics for for articles that you think would uh, uh convey uh, the fulbright uh, impact uh recommendations about authors uh uh, either to to write articles or to be interviewed, uh, letters to the editors on various uh, topics, uh, and this uh, uh, conference is just uh, chock full of of really uh, uh, poignant, powerful work being done by by Fulbrighters. And uh, uh, you see on the slide here, uh, both uh, Bruce and and my emails are there. Feel free to reach out. Uh, I know some people are commenting in the chat. And we do have a website uh, link there. Uh, it's still in early stages. Uh, we hope to, to launch it sometime in the spring of 2022, but the only way we can really succeed is through the engagement of the Fulbright uh, community. So again, thank you. And we look forward to the continuing the conversation if, in the Q&A part. So back to you, Alicia. Thank you again. Thank you, thank you so much, Kevin and Bruce. Um, next, we have um, Peru. Peru, yes, thank you. Uh, hi, thank you so much. Uh, can you, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. And I think we're just waiting for you to share your presentation oh, yeah. if you have one. Yeah. One second. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, perfect. I'm just trying to um, Okay, great. Um, so hello everyone. Um, I'm Parul Shravastav and I'm currently a Fulbright visiting researcher at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Um, I would like to thank all of my fellow panelists here today uh, for the tremendous work that you've been doing. And I'm just starting out in the field. I'm still a PhD candidate back in India. And I'm working on India's partition that happened in 1947. Um, so my main aim of, you know, like participating in, in this conference is to sort of create an awareness around this event that happened in South Asia. Uh, because when I came here, I realized that not a lot of people know about it in, in the sense that, you know, like this is the largest um, human migration that was ever recorded in uh, history. 
And, you know, we all know about the First World War. We all know about the Second World War. But what about India's partition? What about the creation of Pakistan? What about the creation of Bangladesh? Um, so I would just like to start from there. And um, so, yeah, the partition happened and, you know, the wounds of partition, uh, they've still not healed. People who experience partition directly have gone, but the wounds remain. Um, these, these wounds reappear in different forms. It may not be in the same way as it used to be there when it actually happened. Uh, for example, partition created indo pak tension, uh, which continues till today. It has further aggravated and has taken the shape of war sometimes, and we don't know what more dimensions uh, will be added to it in the coming future. Um, another sample of the partition wounds was the dispute of Kashmir and the communal riots. Uh, these kinds of riots did happen in India, but post-partition, the division between communities became incredibly specific. Um, secondly, the religious feelings became rigid, which was not the case earlier. So this took the shape of extremism and fundamentalism. The kind of feelings that the Indians and Pakistanis have today about war has given a different dimension to all of it. Whatever be the issue, be it partition, be it refugee influx, um, internal communal riots, etc., the one section that has to bear the brunt of it is the common population, it's the common citizens. Um, so one of the experiences that have not been paid a lot of attention is what happened to them, you know, how did they migrate? Um, because it, it ultimately comes down to them. Um, and if we talk about women during the partition, uh, so many of them were raped, they were abducted, they were sold into part, uh, prostitution, they were coercively married. And the narrative of sexual viol violation of women during the violence of partition has been a narrative that was pretty silent until, you know, like the 90s. Um, so yeah, uh, for instance, you know, like if I talk about the Thua Khalsa massacre that happened during partition. Uh, so in the village of Thua Khalsa, men kill their own wives their daughters, their mothers, and sometimes committed suicide after doing so. This was done because they did not want their women to fall into the hands of the other community. So around 80 women ran towards a nearby well and gave their own lives by jumping into it. Uh, one of the women described, uh, uh, described the scene and she said that, um, just like the bread on the surface of a tandoor cannot cook properly, similarly, I survived because I happened to be on the top. So this happened a lot during partition. And emotionally, the partition was such a huge wound, especially for the Punjabis and the Bengalis, as well as for the minorities. Uh, for example, the Parsis, the Sindhis, the Christians. Uh, so this kind of, you know, like narrative has been pushed. Uh, we've kind of pushed this aspect of partition under the carpet. And we, a lot of times, you know, like there's no attempt to talk about this. Um, uh, so yeah, this sort of issue keeps on coming up in some form or the other in the present times. There is always some threat of a clash or a war or even a threat of a nuclear attack from both sides of the border, you know, like a couple of years ago. So this is because we have war mongering people on both sides. So considering this, if at all a war breaks out, it is going to affect everybody because war cannot be localized. So um, similarly, the repercussions of partition reached out to the south of India as well. And it is something that needs to be talked about. Um, you know, so uh, this picture right here, you can see that um, this is from one of the interviews that I conducted and I was funded by the Berkeley based 1947 partition archive. And um, so this is my, you know, like little setup when I started in, in 2018. That's my spare phone. That's my, uh, you know, release form and consent form right there. Um, yeah. And uh, this on the screen is a map of the Indian subcontinent and the red line that you can see on either sides. They've been, you know, they, this, this, is, this is called the Radcliffe line. And this right here is uh, Sir Cyril Radcliffe, who was sort of, you know, like given the mammoth task of dividing the subcontinent. And what's interesting is that he had never set foot on the Indian subcontinent. So you can imagine the, you know, like callousness that was observed by the British when they were doing this. Um, Okay, and, and this is my great grandfather's copy of India Divided that I don't know, like somehow is really, you know, dear to me. And because I am doing research in that area, I always make sure it's with me. Um, and so this is a picture by Margaret Burke White. Um, she was the one who was sort of documenting these, you know, like gripping pictures, uh, gr gripping scenes, I would say, you know, like from uh, what was unfolding in the Indian subcontinent. And this is how people actually migrated, you know, like they walked for miles and miles at a stretch and some were lucky to reach the other side, some were not. And, you know, like these are some more pictures from her um, photography. And she was an American photographer, 
that time she was working for the life magazine and you know like this was a situation of people on reaching delhi so i am just giving you know i'm just showing all of these pictures to everybody so that you get a perspective of what happened during india's partition um and yeah so this is you know like the, a, a rough number of people displaced and again a rough number of people perished there is no you know sort of data to prove this but then you know we all know that the actual you know number of people who are displaced and perished is usually always you know a uh, greater than you know the government records um so you know if we talk about this research if we talk about my research uh, the problem with you know this this particular project is that there is no source of primary witness accounts and you know the remaining population that is people who were born before 1947 they are in their 80s people who remember something you know it's a dwindling population for example here on the screen you can see uh, mrs mohini manglik and i interviewed her in lucknow unfortunately she is not there with us today uh, so you know this is why this research is so relevant um, it's it's very important and the time is now so that you know like we can go and sort of record these very you know valuable um, oral history narratives from people who actually witnessed the india in, in the partition of india um, so of late you know we've started uh, you know having some kind of awareness even in the indian subcontinent and as a result we have the first partition museum that's been set up in amritsar which i visited in december 2017 it was inaugurated in september of the same year and there again you have some uh, you know oral testimonies of people who witnessed the event of partition then we have the 1947 partition archive who funded me uh, to conduct interviews so i did conduct 61 interviews across india in in six indian cities and the mission of the archive is to document preserve and share eyewitnesses account from all ethnic religious and socio economic communities affected by the partition of india in 1947 and that's the page of their website so you can actually see uh, you know where all the archive has conducted um, you know these oral history interviews of course the major chunk of it of it is in the indian subcontinent um so this is a a, a picture of you know mrs mehta who's interviewed i who's interview i conducted in hyderabad and that's her and you know like she sort of shared with me her her story of you know the turbulent journey the train journey that she took from you know um, pakistan to present day india and the kind of you know problems that they had to face uh, back then so um another you know very important interview i would say is of you know mrs begum who who i interviewed in kanpur in the northern part of india so her story is very interesting for me because um she has a lot of she had a lot of sisters and her father was really worried about the safety of you know his daughters um so they ultimately you know like um, thought of migrating and while they were about to you know uh, get on get on a ship to go to karachi pakistan they heard the news of you know mahatma gandhi's assassination but then you know like they had to go so they went to karachi but then um, a year later her father along with the family they returned back to india because you know uh, it's it's according to him his entire property was in india his you know like means of income everything was in india so it did not really make sense for him to stay over there which again you know like sort of contradicts a lot of beliefs that people have in terms of migration during partition because in spite of the fact that they belong to the minority community they chose to sort of you know like come back to india because of economic reasons and uh, the sad part is that in that one year while they were in karachi um her mother passed away and her you know grave today is in pakistan she hasn't been able to see the grave to go back to the grave since 1950 two of her sisters they got married in pakistan so they are still there of course um and she hasn't met them after 1980s you know like the time when the tension between india and pakistan started you know aggravating um okay so the last in interview i want to share with you is of mr jumani from hyderabad and his story is again very interesting he was born in 1944 and um he was he visited pakistan on several occasion occasions you know like after that as an adult because he was trying to make a documentary um and in one of those visits in 2006 2007 um he actually went back to his village and got his birth certificate so all his life he did not have his birth certificate but then you know like in 2006 2007 it's it's a great story uh, so the, and the reason that i am pointing this out is that you know um 
the partition of the Indian subcontinent is, is always, you know, like marked with a lot of violence. And this kind of heartwarming stories are some, you know, somehow always pushed in the background. We do not talk about them. And it is only if you talk to people who actually migrated that, you know, you will realize, um, you know, the, the extent of, of the narratives that people have. It's, it's not just violence. It's not just happiness. It's a lot of mixed feelings. And I think it, it will only come out if we go out and interview people, if we, you know, preserve, archive, safeguard, record all of those materials. Um, so, yeah, I think... Yeah, and in the end, I would just like to share this quote from Mufir Fan Mia, who resided in Lucknow at the time of partition. And he said that we're all the same. We're all eating the same dal and chawal that is lentils and rice. And everything else is just spices and chutney. I think it has a great, you know, like really deep meaning. And I really love, um, you know, this quote. So I just felt like sharing with everybody. Um, thank you so much. I am glad to, you know, like share whatever little, you know, like I have done so far in in you know, this little time with all of you. I hope that your knowledge about India's partition and, you know, the history of South Asia has increased somehow and you would like to sort of go and, you know, like read more about it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Parul. And thank you to all of our speakers for their insightful presentations. Um, I now will ask that a full panel come online, turn your cameras on if you like, we will now start the Q&A segment of the session. Perfect. So I will first ask some questions that came in through the Q&A. Um, I also encourage you all presenters to ask questions of each other if you like or to chime in if okay. something resonates with you. Alicia, I can't turn on my video. And I can't either. Okay, <laughs> one second. Let me find you all here and I'll, I'll help with that. Yeah. Very good. Perfect. Who else am I missing? Do I have everyone? Hi. Thank you very much for this okay. opportunity. It was great. Okay, perfect. You all were great. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, so the first question I have is for Yasmin and Abdullah. Um, has online teaching necessitate, necessitated by the pandemic been as effective in training and bilingualism as in person? How can they complement each other? So um, I'm going to start and then I'm going to turn it over to Abdullah. Sure. I think without, um, we have discovered that we can work together across continents, time zones, and cultural divides with a synchronous Zoom uh, format. And this has been a great addition because I would not be able normally to just travel to Yemen once a month or once a week during a workshop. And um, I would say that in this case, yes, it has very much enriched our ability for collaborative, interactive sessions. Abdullah, how do you feel? Yeah, it was really great. Uh, I mean, when Dr. Jasmine initiated that she would give uh, online webinars to, to our uh, TESOL uh, trainees here, uh, it was for us really a, an amazing experience. Uh, she did uh many uh, like so far she, she has presented like four workshops about tesol uh, resources uh, and the trainees here they really enjoyed it uh, i would like to highlight just uh, i mean though the presentations were really wonderful but because of the war here in yemen and because of the facilities uh, the only uh, uh, i mean uh, what I say, uh, problem that we faced was the speed of the internet here in Yemen. But the workshops that uh, Dr. Shasmin presented were really wonderful. All the participants, they really enjoyed them. And uh, I've, I've heard from them, they, they started using these, uh, I mean, ideas that she presented uh, online in, in their classes. So online teaching, uh, online webinars is really a, a great opportunity to uh, exchange knowledge uh, uh, through, I mean, uh, for us as Fulbrighters 
uh, so it was really great, yes. Yeah, so what my focus really was, because, you know, Yemen is a poor country, was on open educational resources and everything that is free, has free access, um, you know, from, from our library, you know, the internet archive to the ORS and giving Yemeni teachers what we call, when we talk about equity and access, you know, I, I went through a lot of meetings. It is meaningless to talk about it unless you make an effort to actually do something to give people the tools that they have equal access. That's it. That's it, yeah. So Yemen has been experiencing civil war and conflict for years, right? Um, how true. has this affected the educational community? What role, if any, do Fulbrighters have in Yemen as they are charged with advanced in peace? So my first shock was when Abdullah, when we first talked, that he that teachers don't get paid their salaries, their wages. Oh, that, that has been for seven years Talking. since the war started. Shocking, yeah. shocking. Yeah, yeah, this is and, and that's where this all grew. And I said, so, and can people afford the training? No, they can. So I looked at what my life consists of, right? The, the, the coffee here and the Starbucks there and the haircut there. And I said to myself, I can afford $500 to train teachers. I just need to cut out a couple of things and I don't even notice them because they, they're meaningless. I just, I'm gonna cook at home. I'm not gonna go out, period. So like I'll practice more harp. And all of a sudden I realized that the path to a better world, is to think about where we can use for each one of us the money that we have in the best way possible. And I still believe it is educating our teachers because that's the long-term impact. Abdullah? It was really so kind of and generous of Dr. Jasmine to, to really share our uh, like feelings. Yes, uh, because of the word, uh, Yemeni teachers uh, haven't received the salaries for many years. They're suffering. Uh, but uh, we're trying, like as for writers, to do our best to help. So this is what I'm trying to do, just like to help uh, Yemeni teacher teachers to get some training. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Jasmine for, for her contribution. Uh, I would like also to take this opportunity to thank the Fulbright program and Amidist for helping in this regard. Uh, as I said, in 2019, they helped in training 30 Yemeni teachers, and this year they're helping in training 50 Yemeni, uh, Yemeni TESOL teachers. This is great. This will help a lot of teachers, not only the teachers. You can look at the impact, the long-term impact, how these teachers will help in uh, improving the quality of teaching in their language institutes. By the way, there's a high demand for learning English in Yemen. Uh, students in Yemen, they, they think that English is the gate to pursue higher education, to get jobs. So that's why we really care. We, we I mean, uh, both of us, uh, Dr. Jasmine and I, uh, found that we have some common goals, which is uh, to help uh, fresh graduates to get some training so they can uh, contribute in helping uh, to improve the quality of education in Yemen. So I just want to say one thing. So um, when I was a Fulbrighter to Houston, I arrived there with I would say a very spotty English and a very small amount of knowledge of the world, right? I thought I was going to go to the Ponderosa because I had watched, you know, <laughs> this is before computers. I was shocked at the amount of roaches and the size of them. And I, uh, I ended up having no idea of what I was doing because I was so young. I ended up basically not having a place to stay. So I was taken in by a bunch of other international students from India who took me in and I said, I have no money. I can't do anything for you. And they looked at me and I just, I just shared it with you. And they said to me, may your life be a garland of beautiful deeds. They said, and that's all we want you to remember. And I did remember. And that is because Fulbright gave me an opportunity and they said, she can go. I would have stayed home, but I went and it's an adventure. And then when we come back out of this experience, I think we each have an opportunity to really share more than just the experience, but the power of one 
should never be underestimated. You know, it's like the starfish that's dying on the beach. You throw it into the, into the ocean, you made a difference to that one. Maybe you didn't save all of them, but you made a difference. That's true. Very profound. Thank you. Thank you both so much. The next question I have is for Dr. Golder. Um, Janet, you shared the beautiful works of Molly Otis. So please correct me if I'm wrong, but apart from quilters, it looks like the artists are mostly men. Are there any gender dynamics in the artistic community in Mali and what effects do they have on art? Well, first of all, the, the work of group Kasa, Bogolan Kasabani is not quilting. It's, it's a, a surface design technique that um, it's a, a traditional technique of painting with natural dyes. So there's no quilting involved. Um, the group Kasabani is a group of five women and, and uh, uh, five men and one woman. Um, but in the, um, and for a long time, um, I would say that the artistic scene in, in Mali and in the US and around the world is dominated by men, like everything else. So it's not particular to, to Mali, it's, it, it's part of it, but in, um, the contemporary art scene is much more um, diverse. And in the program Karal that we had, they were mostly men, but, we, but there were maybe 20% women, which was, um, it was the, the participants in Karal um, applied, um, you know, op answered an open call. And so we chose from who was, um, who applied, but, um, Yes, of course, there's gender dynamics. There's gender dynamics everywhere. <laughs> everywhere, right? <laughs> Has your collaboration um, include entrepreneurship development at all? I don't, I, I mean, my, my collaboration is about artistic practice. And so to the extent that it helps sustain us as artists, it's, um, it's I suppose, entrepreneurship, but but you know, traditional culture and cultures in that are not cultural practices that are not from dominant cultures are really in danger. So, trying to preserve uh, traditional cultures and traditional uh, cultural practices um, is a huge job in itself. Um, I've had ideas for um, more entrepreneurial. Um, projects, but I haven't been successful in funding them. One of the things that I wanted to do, especially um, during the, this ongoing crisis in Mali, it's interesting how many of our projects have to do with places, poor countries that are experiencing um, civil unrest and war. Um, I wanted the, um, one of the projects I have not been successful in funding was to take, um, because there's there's no tourism in Mali anymore because of the because of the crisis, and so the local artisans, not the artists, the visual artists, but the artisans, um, have lost their market, and and so rather than importing their goods to to outside of Mali, I wanted to work with them to reintroduce these goods that came out of the local culture back into the local culture since there is no market, and I. Um, so it's it's kind of local, you know, sustainable development, local lo local um, consumption, and, but I it, people are so focused on on export that it's very hard to get anybody to talk about developing this um, these local techniques and local heritage for local usage to send it back into the local culture. I mean, there's plenty of um, you know, used clothing and, and plastic stuff from China and all sorts of other things that, but um, Mali has a rich culture of taking care of itself. So I'd love to, but, but there's not support for it. I appreciate you for sure. And thank you. Um, so Kevin and Bruce, you mentioned that the Chronicles helped to promote the good work of Fulbrighter's venues and also encourage future collaborations. Who do you think read and benefit from the Fulbright Chronicles? And how do you plan to reach and expand that audience? 
Yeah, and Bruce, you want to take it, or I'm glad to take a stab. And oh, take a stab. Go okay. ahead. Yeah, so I think that's a really great uh, question, Alicia, of of uh, of about how we share the stories about the impact of, of Fulbright, and it's also a, a challenge for the Peace Corps volunteer. These are programs that are supported by um, mainly by the U.S. government, U.S. taxpayers. So uh, there are country programs that provide matching support. So it's really important we get the story out. And, and I, I heard uh, during the conference that there's a, a, a palpable um, interest on, on behalf of all Fulbrighters to stay connected to the communities and institutions uh, we uh, have worked with. And we wanna broaden and deepen our experience so I, I think uh, initially uh, that the audience is people who have some connection to the Fulbright experience, but we will fall short if we uh, are just talking to ourselves. So we need to find ways to, to uh, get the content in the hands of policy makers and decision makers in various countries. And to do that, we're gonna need the Fulbright community's uh, help uh, many of our community uh, members uh, play leading roles in shaping uh, policy on a whole range of uh, critical issues and encouraging them to use the content from Fulbright Chronicles and other places to get the word out and to try and uh, shape uh, discussions in a way that uh, helps all of us achieve a, a goal that I think we all share. That is, we want to have an impact. So I think you you touched on it a little bit, um, but a question just came in asking what can Fulbright alums do to assure the successful launch and sustainability of the journal? And it's just getting the word out. Do you want to expand on that a little bit more? Well, well go ahead. Yeah, yeah and uh, uh, Kevin, you did a great job, I, I think, uh, expanding on, uh, on that question. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, we want as many contributions as possible from as many different people as possible that are involved with the Fulbright program. Uh, that uh, is a primary goal. Um, but another goal that we have is that uh, uh, this journal is one that we fully intend uh, to be listed in major databases uh, of scholarly journals. And uh, that, that too, I think, will help to get the word out in terms of um, uh, Fulbright Chronicles and um, will certainly enhance the impact of the journal going forward. So um, you start small, uh, which we have done. Uh, this is a quarterly journal. It's, it's open access, it's peer reviewed. Uh, we're gonna see where that takes us, but I think that um, the future uh, given the interest that we've already had, um, uh, is bright. And uh, uh, there's a lot of um, enthusiasm and energy, uh, I think, that already exists um, for the journal. And if I can just add one thing, I, I think, Jasmine, your, your comments about a little bit of, uh, of uh, trying to, to uh, be flexible in how we use our resources, that, that passion can be a real driver. It, it's, uh, and, and we're proposing that this is an all volunteer effort. So it's the passion of, of Fulbrighters and others who care about it, who will contribute and uh, make it work. And uh, we need your help in getting the word, word out, but we're trying to do this in a really economical uh, way. But uh, uh, that creates opportunities for our community and, and hopefully raises up our voices to uh, new and um, current audiences. Kevin, I have a question. Yeah, please. You know, I'm a big, I'm a big Rotarian. I don't know. Yep, yep. Ro Rotary so, is a great network. Yep. So my question is, you know, sometimes when we, when, when, when two networks are able, they can complement and, yep. and multiply Mm -hmm. um, each other's message because I know, for example, India and Pakistan have very big. Um, they they have very big 
uh, Rotary chapters, and they're very, very active. And I, I used to be the, the, the president of, of, of the New York Club and then an assistant governor, but I've stepped back to focus more on, on Yemen. But my question is, would, would you be interested in exploring um, something like that? Or have you already explored uh, such I, I don't even know if it's an affiliation or if it's a reaching out. I, I, the words fail me at this yeah, point. Right. Yeah. So we, we haven't explored that yet. But uh, at the National Peace Corps Association, we had multiple conversations. There are parallel networks out there of full writers, various international uh, exchange uh, programs, their, their networks that they have, uh, that I, I think we'll find a lot of uh, overlap of people who've been Fulbrighters, who've also been AFS uh, students, been uh, uh, scholars of different sorts, uh, Rhodes Scholars, uh, Marshall Scholars, um, those kinds of other programs. And uh, we're hopefully, uh, as we get more people uh, engaged with this, and, and we want to be really clear, this, is, this was an idea that Bruce and I have been talking about for, for years, going back to 2007, of, we want to talk more about the impact. And, well, I think one of the first things that yeah. come to mind would be you have these local Fulbright recipients right. speaking at the local Rotary or Lions exactly. Club chapters, you know, right. talking about the impact because they, they are full of members who would be listening and you never know yeah. what happens collaboratively. You no, just that's great. And, and I hope John Bader and, and Alicia and others are taking note of that. And I'm not sure to what extent they've had those conversations, but Fulbrighters are a great resource for uh, Rotary communities. And yeah, that's great. But thanks for that question. And uh, we welcome more. <laughs> Noted. Yeah, <thank> <laughs> Noted. I'm sure John's somewhere in the background yeah. taking all the notes. Right. Um, so if somebody, if someone wants to submit work um, for the journal, what is that process and how soon can they do that? This is to you, Kevin. Yeah, I'm, I'm oh, go ahead, Bruce. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, um, you know, there's a great deal of information that's available on the website, which I, I've shared with everyone. That's a, a, a mock-up uh, of what the journal will be like. And that includes, um, you know, some sample articles um, that we put together, uh, commentaries, as well as letters, just to give people an idea as to, you know, what we're looking for. And, you um, you know, again, the hope is um, to get this um, uh, our first issue out uh, in um, uh, sometime this coming spring, and uh, we're almost done uh, forming our uh, associate uh, editorial board. And um, uh, there was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm uh, uh, for that. Um, but again, a lot of information uh, on that website or by contacting uh, uh, Kevin uh, or myself. Um, uh, again, I shared our email uh, with everyone here uh, as well. So uh, please do uh, contact us um, uh, and uh, take a look at the material that's on the website itself. And I think that um, uh, that information uh, will be helpful to you. But by all means, um, if you have ideas, uh, we want to hear from you. Um, we see this as um, a, a, an effort uh, of the entire uh, Fulbright community. So um, uh, don't be shy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both so much. Sure. Um, Peru, you. and I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but this question is for you. Um, the conflict and tension between Pakistan and India dates from partition. Is it possible that sharing stories and oral histories could help lessen that tension? Oh, yes, absolutely, Alicia. I think it will do a lot in, in you know, like that direction because um, that's how we learn, right? We should learn from our mistakes. And um, given, you know, like the situation where we are heading towards in terms of, you know, like whatever is happening in that part of the world, in my part of the world, I think it's very important to um, learn and also side by side unlearn, you know, like things that um, are sort of, you know, like hindering our uh, peace motives today. So yes, it would definitely um, help in, you know, uh, creating peace in, in the subcontinent, yeah. And um, I'm so sorry, I think I will have to leave because I have another meeting from 12 and I'm already late. 
Oh, so sorry. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank and, you so much. Yeah. I, I yes. think I've tried to, you know, like reply to everyone in the comments. Um, and I'm sorry if I missed out on, you know, like any comment or any question. I'm so sorry for that. Uh, but thank you so much. Everyone. That's okay, Parul. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thank Anisha. you. Thanks a lot. We have a couple minutes left, um, maybe like one minute, if anybody, if any of the panelists um, have anything else to say, any other questions for each other, um, I'll take a moment. So, uh, Alicia, I have a quick question it's just about sharing uh, some of the PowerPoints. Could you explain that? I, I, Janet had so many wonderful images that were so powerful and I'd, I'd love to spend more time with them. So can you talk about how uh, these images and PowerPoints are, are shared with the participants? Thank you. Yeah, I think I could touch a little bit on that. And Munir, if you if you want to add anything additional, but we are, um, we are going to create a Google folder and we're going to ask all the presenters to submit their right. PowerPoints or their works to that Google folder. So it's up to them if they want to submit that. Um, and we're also recording all of the sessions as well, which we will share out at a later date. Great, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, again, that's thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. Wonderful speakers. Um, thanks for sharing your work, your knowledge. Um, and thank you all attendees for receiving this information and participating with us today. Right. Thank you very much. That's all the time we have. You're welcome. Um, I just want to say that our networking coffee break begins right after this session, uh, I believe at 12.15. So it starts right now. Um, and I'm going to post the link in the Thank chat you. if you want to pop over there. Okay. I will hope to see you there soon. Okay. There you go. Thanks Thank again, you everyone. Bye-bye.